and hazardous and solid waste management. He has been a visiting professor, scientist, and lecturer across the United States and the world, and he has received so many honors and awards. I cannot tell you I have seen his resume, and he has published dozens of research papers and reports, and most important, he, like my husband, is a retired rugby player. Right. Michael. Thank you, Heidi, and thanks to you all for your invitation. Um, I got involved with uh, the Lanel issues about five years ago with uh, one of my friends, Bob Gilkison, who's done an incredible amount of work as a volunteer in this area. Um, I don't see him today, um, but you have to know that he gives a damn, and I give a damn. Um, I've done a lot of work with communities that have super fun sites in their uh, uh, vicinity in Indiana, Michigan, South, Southern, South Calumet, Illinois, South Chicago, Illinois. Um, and generally, I find that the handling of these types of complex issues by regulatory, regulatory uh, authorities falls far short of what I would expect. And that's no different here. I don't know if NMED even reads the Lionel reports. I've read reports for the last two years. I testified against, not in favor of, the RICRA permit two years ago. The, the pile of paper is now about like this for the floor. Okay? Um, and it's disturbing reading to, to me after having been involved with many, many hazardous <coughs> Um this is uh, Material Disposal Area G, along with other um, areas. It's this lower pink body there. And there are wells here that are supposed to monitor the groundwater flow across the area. Groundwater moves in response to a vertical height difference. And so it goes downhill, essentially. And I'm going to show you some graphs that show essentially the stairs through which um, groundwater will pass and has passed. I don't want to minimize the difficulty of it. <coughs> the geology is extremely complex. Um, there are many formations that intersect at unknown contact points. There are known faults on the east side of MDAG. You can look at a fault as a sideways or vertical cut in the cake, the layer cake geology, you might say, which are essentially windows to lower formations which lead to the regional aquifer, which is what some of the Buckman wells draw on. And certainly, um, there is some discharge to the Rio Grande in this regard. Um, the Buckman Direct Diversion Project is really two projects. You have a contact on the river where water is taken from the river, like it, as if with a straw, and brought to the treatment plant that was mentioned earlier. Um, it is one of the most sophisticated and expensive to run treatment plants I've ever seen. Um, as long as it doesn't hiccup, Many of the radionuclides will be taken out. But tritium is present as tritiated water. And one thing you don't take out of water in a water treatment plant is water. Um, we know from limited data that the circles represent hot spots of tritium and chlorinated solvents. Solvents like tri and tetrachloroethylene. Trichloroethane. These are degreasing agents. Um, they're used extensively in industrial processes for cleaning metal parts, machine parts. You got grease on them. 
the TCE or TCA will <coughs> remove that grease. And because of the discharge of these materials in material disposal area G, you have vapor plumes of these um, constituents that extend well into four to five hundred feet into the aquifer. Regional aquifers around a thousand feet, more or less, depends. Now, similarly, there are tritium and chlorinated hotspots associated with other areas. Um, there are a huge tritium hotspot here, another here, and another on the top there. Um, this is tritiated water vapor. You've got water vapor in the some of these um, in, 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 in liquid water in some of these formations. It may not constitute a, a usable drinking water source because it's not extensive enough, but it's there. And given the uncertainty that we have with the actual geology here, the groundwater flow patterns, um, there's a lifetime supply of tritium up there. Believe me. Several lifetimes. The geologic cross-section, and this is simplified. Um, this is a north-south cross-section across <coughs> material disposal area G. And you have a significant sort of layer cake affair in here with the regional water table about here. And this is height above sea level. So we have a good reference there. The problem is the wells at Lanel, MDAG, are horrible. They have multiple openings, which is just more windows to lower aquifer conditions. So you drill through those contaminated areas with tritium and chlorinated solvents, you're opening up a conduit with which to deliver them to the lower aquifer. And I have no doubt it's happening even given the fact that they sample erratically. You're supposed to sample quarterly. They don't do that. You're supposed to sample uniformly. I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to, you know, give it all away. <laughs> so what are some of, it's free, though, okay? What are some of the contaminants that land on DAG? Uranium, tritium, technetium. Those were mentioned by Dr. Makajani just a few minutes ago. Um, the inorganics, chromium, beryllium. More than 16,000 workers at Lano were exposed to beryllium over the years. They were told in 1999. They've been machining beryllium up there since 44. It's hard to machine metal without getting stuff sprayed all over the place. And the inhaled dose of beryllium is very, very dangerous. Much more so than drinking it and drinking water. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, organic constituents. Various phenols. Phenols are basically... <laughs> sorry? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, phenols are basically a benzene ring with an OH group on it. It's a little bit more mobile in, in water. It's very soluble in water. Even the chlorophenols, chlorinated substituted phenols, are very soluble in water. And uh, phenol, um, historically, carbolic acid. If you remember being in a hospital 50 years ago, you smell this kind of an acrid smell, almost like menthol, that's phenol. They, they use it all the time. Um, trichloroethylene, trichloroethane, I mentioned those before. Benzoate pyrene. Benzoate pyrene is a combustion product of various organic materials. It's in cigarette smoke, cigar smoke, um, they, they're still disposing of explosives at Lanel by exploding them. Guess what? There are ways to de-fuse de uh, um, these materials. Blowing them up is the easy way out. And, you know, by the way, I think that kind of, that's just kind of fun when you contain the products. But you can't contain the products if you're up on the top of a giant hill um, other uh, organic contaminants, phthalate esters, phthalates are most, a lot of plastics. They're plasticizers. Um, they keep the plastic flexible. Substituted benzenes and 
Uh, I apologize. Organic acids, A-C-I-D-S. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay. What are the pathways for contaminant movement? Vapor transport. We know the TCE has been mobile since the early 2000s. Stouffer, that's actually Stouffer, not Stouffler, um, detected that in some of the springs on the, on the I want to say, northeast side of Lano years ago. Uh, McGlynn did found a similar uh, concentration of mobile uh, tritium in the same <coughs> session. Um, runoff transport of contaminants and sediments to the Rio Grande. I know that the Buckman Direct Diversion Project conducted or had a, a group, which I respect, do a um, risk a risk assessment of that the vulnerability of their groundwater supply, both from in, from river direct river uh, uh, diversion as well as pumping from the Buckman well field, and they didn't find excess risk given current drinking water standards. But it was conducted under something called base flow conditions, which means no runoff. Now we know that run, no runoff is unrealistic given the damage that's been done to the watersheds by the fires. Uh, groundwater transport. Um, the roughly down gradient wells from MVAG, um, R22 screen 5 and R41 screen 2, have shown evidence of contaminants in the past. Despite the fact that they're constructed like a real bad tinker toy job, you know? And I, I'm, it's, it's aggravating because we've known how to do this correctly for 30 years. Since the uh, Cerro Grande fire around 2000, um, we have seen increases. This is a, a logarithmic scale. So it goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000 cubic feet per second. Um, clearly, in the, in the rainy season, ever since then, we've had at least six um, events where the flow rates were well above 1,000 or 500, 500 cubic feet per second. Those are significant um, runoff events. And yes, there's been some attempts to put in some, some uh, runoff control mechanisms, but they're not yet adequate to the task. I don't believe. When it gets run off, eventually it's going to end up in, in, the, in the Rio Grande River. Or, worse yet, in an unprotected groundwater source, like that for the Pueblo de San Ildefonso, they don't have a treatment system that Be Buckman has. And their vulnerability is much higher. Okay. Taking the data on water levels from the existing wells, and they've got, some of these wells have five screens or windows to the geology in different formations. Um, and you have to be careful about interpreting these because these wells were drilled using organic laden clay muds, which we've known for 25 years contaminate geological deposits. It's not the right way to drill. They were told that for the last 13, 14 years. Um, but they did it anyway. And they lost. Imagine drilling a well a thousand feet and you lose 3,000 pounds of organic drilling mud. That means it went somewhere into the aquifer. Because it's organic, well, part, partly organic, there's organic additives to the clay mixture, bentonite clay mixture. And we use these muds to pull cuttings out of the ground. There are other ways to do it. Air rotary. You pump air down and blow the cuttings out. Air doesn't have the long-lasting effects on the aquifer's chemistry that the mud does, especially a ton and a half. Um, so, just for um, focus here, the red line is a, the predominant line of movement down these stair steps. And 
The lab has contended for years that the only conceivable direction of groundwater flow is to the, uh, the southeast. Well, the Pueblo de San Ildefonso and other tributaries to the Rio Grande that might affect the Buckman are to the northeast, not southeast. If you take some of the wells that are sort of questionable out of the picture, um, you get even a stronger northeasterly flow. Okay? And that sort of left turn that the water seems to be taking is right where the faults are. Have they done extensive geophysics to look at where these faults are? No. Basic problem. One of the first steps in setting up a monitoring system is to know the geology. Then you want to know the distribution of contaminants. And then you start drilling wells. And they squeak through this long by saying, oh, these aren't monitoring wells, these are regional wells. I don't care what you call them. But NMED has agreed that some of them are good for monitoring. And I contend that that is wrong. Other versions. You look at flow in that direction. If you take some of the really bad wells out, they have nothing to the northeast. No sentinel wells. Um, it's in the regional aquifer already. So we correct that a little bit. We get a little bit different, but a dominant northeasterly flow. And so on. Okay, what are the sources of, of uncertainty? Wells are drilled with shoddy technique, as I mentioned, mud rotary. They have multiple screened intervals. They didn't get the seal drilling the well with the, into the bedrock. It's all rock. Very little sand and gravel in there, but occasionally there are, and that's full of groundwater that's contaminated. Um, these screened intervals allow vertical flow, especially since they didn't seal the well bore completely. So not only did they have the mud invade the aquifer, but they also let aquifer levels communicate with each other. Um, they don't have enough wells out there to really define the well, the flow direction. But, you know, we corrected it three to four different ways. Bob Gilkison corrected it four different ways. And son of a gun. Still, it's a predominant northeast component of flow. Um, we don't know enough about the subsurface features. I mentioned the faults, but there's also volcanic dikes. Volcanic dikes are, are volca volcanic sort of um, emissions where you've got molten flow up into the overlying uh, formations. <coughs> These represent conduits for vertical flow. Um, you've got a lot of discontinuities, as I mentioned before. And they haven't done the geophysical testing that could be done to verify where these faults are and what their direction is. And they, should, they don't have wells that are reliable enough to do a monitored pump test, where you pump a well over here in the same formation as one over here and see if the water level responds in this one. Now, it's much, more, it's much more complex than that because you want a network of wells to see where these wells connect with each other. But the levels at which the wells are, that currently are in are so, I don't know, random, it's hard to tell how you get any hydraulic signal from pumping a well over here. You don't know exactly what to attribute it to. Do we have methods to sort this out? We certainly do. We've had them for 25 years. It's not rocket science, folks. Either that or I'd never be in the field. Um, there are tritium levels in the Buckman well field. Now I know they have a huge storage tank where both diversion water and water from the well field is pumped. They have a hiccup in the treatment system. They're going to have other radionuclides potentially pass into the water supply. 
um, at least in three cases, wells one and eight, they're the top two, they found tritium at the uh, two to three picogram, or picocurie per liter level. Um, as you notice, at the top one there, you've got 2.96, 9.49 picocurie per liter. The deviation is about 0.83. Okay, that's about 30, plus minus 30%. That's not uncommon, but we can do better. We can do better. And given some of Dr. Makajani's comments about the potential for lower level radiological effects, I think they deserve to be done by a lab that's really competent with this. One exists, several exist, one at the University of Illinois Chicago, one at the University of Miami. Um, they're good guys and, gir and gals, and they do good work. Um, similarly, the other well that's near the, the river, uh, well 8, some similar levels, and also well 6, which is about, I'd say, maybe four or 500 feet from the river, maybe, maybe farther. So, I mean, the, the water level in the river is a function of runoff and where that water table is. That's as simple as it, as it can get. Um, depends how long has it been since it rained and the river received appreciable runoff. But it's not something you want to finesse. So the, somebody or some force has to hold their feet to the fire to do a good job. <laughs> Back in 2005, 2007, sorry, I'm taking too long, um, um, NMED would write to the lab and say, you know what, you've got to replace these wells and please start using consistent sampling methods. Then around 2007, I've seen all the, a lot of the correspondence, um, they just get more and more lenient. Oh, well, you know, the water doesn't smell like it's contaminated. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, what do we have chemistry for? You know, why do we have $100,000 instruments to make measurements? We don't use them. Um, anyway. <laughs> What do we got to do to get their attention? I don't know. In the bottom slide it says swim faster. I don't have to swim faster than the shark. I just have to swim faster than you. Um, bottled water. A collaboration between the Killian company and the Japanese company. They drink a, 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 a lot of water in containers. Most bottled water is basically tap water with a fancy little brand name on it. There's about five brands that actually do advanced treatment methods and present their results. Nestle has one. Gerber has one. There's another one I can't remember. But the Environmental Working Group has looked at bottled water. That's not a panacea. That's not going to get you out of trouble. And, you know, these kitchen sink uh, filters, well, got to have a lot of faith for that stuff. Um, and diet water, because we know water is full of calories. <laughs> Thank you very much for the end.